All right, 11 a.m. kickoff. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this latest edition of Luna's live webinar series, Blow by Blow with Blob Sled. Uh, this is the first to feature one of our customers, and uh, fitting that Bob Sled uh, is up as they were our first. So, my name is Joe Goodman. I'm the sales engineering director here at Luna Technologies. Joining us today is co founder Kyler Buck uh, with Bob Sled Extracts as well as Adam Hain with technical sales here at Luna Technologies. So um, today's webinar will be kind of a behind the scenes look at Bobsled's extraction facility. Uh, the goal here is to visually show folks on here today how the IO extractor um, has allowed them to scale business up, compete at better price points you know, for their consumers without sacrificing quality of their extract. So, um, I'm going to kick things off by bringing you guys to see the preparation of five pound pucks in order to load into the IO extractor. And I'm going to take you guys there. We didn't have enough time here to actually uh, prepare these pucks on camera, but you'll all be able to see uh, this footage. And then we'll jump in and start a real time live resin run on the IO extractor. So, this feature, uh, this video here is going to feature two of uh, Lunatech's biomass packers. Um, these packers are in operations at one of our other customer facility sites and uh, prepared uh, quite a bit of biomass for freezers, approximately 30,000 pounds inside of uh, about a week and a half. So um, quite a bit of biomass. See here, this is a frozen five pound puck. We're able to store them in the freezer this way and it really compresses all that biomass down and makes for great storage. And then we're able to drop these directly into a sock filter, put the sock in the run, and then when the run's over, we just pull the sock out, dump it, and you're able to dispose of your biomass. So it's really cut down on labor and time and improve efficiency as well as consistency on our runs. Awesome. So obviously, I wanted to just give you guys a, a brief look at um, how we're preparing these pucks prior to loading into the machine. But I'm going to pass it over to Kyler here, and uh, we're going to kick it off with the unloading and loading of uh, some biomass into the reactor. Kyle, yeah, can thanks, you hear me? yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, we're going to start off today with a run. And uh, Joe, if you want to follow me, I'll show you. We just ended a run, and you guys saw how we had them prepared in the five-pound pucks. Those pucks are then dropped into a filter bag, which I'll show you here. But if you can see, I just want to show you the ease of use. We've just finished a run right now. Um, so it says reactor solvent recovery complete to start the next process cycle, load new plant material into reactor and press start. So that is what we're about to do. Right here I have prepared that I took out of our walk-in freezer. Now we already have, you know, probably the next two weeks already packed, ready to run. So it's, you'll be able to see how easy it is to load and unload your reactor or material column and really minimize the downtime in between runs. So you can see here is the old puck, old filter sock. Now to unload no more unpacking the column, I just drop it out and, you know, the pucks come out. It's that easy to dump. We reuse these filter socks, you know, we change them and we will clean them out uh, by doing a run and you can actually make them looking brand new again. So I'll just drop this in. And there's, we have 9,000 grams that we loaded up into here. Compress. Mm -hmm. 
So if you saw that, I just changed my run in a matter of, you know, two minutes. And obviously the fans kicked on. What that was is the off gas of the material we just pulled out and dumped right next to our sensor. But it's not enough to signify the alarm. Here we go. So I've loaded the new one, tightened the lid, and I hit start. Now the run is going to automatically start load. It's You can see here the solvent is stored in the solvent tanks. By hitting the start button, it is now vacuuming down the material column. Once it vacuums down and it reaches negative 29, it's then going to initiate a safety pressure check where it will actually check and make sure you have a secure lid and does monitors the pressure for 60 seconds. And then once that 60 seconds is done, it actually loads and starts the run. So Awesome. Thanks, Skylar. Um, so obviously I wanted to jump into a little bit of um, how bobsled got started and uh, a little bit of the history of just bobsled story. Obviously, the success story for Luna Technologies is the fact that uh, you know, you really designed this equipment with Jack Nato, the company president, and that this extraction equipment was basically as a result of a need. Um, and within six months, I think you had your second extractor. And inside of a year, I think now you're operating three at two separate facilities 24 seven. So just give us a little bit of a rundown. Yeah, well, I, when I partnered up with Jack, I was extracting in the medical cannabis market in Oregon since 2013. And really, it was just as an extractor that was also, you know, owning and wanting to operate my own business, I found myself trapped, you know, behind the machine and tied to the extraction. So, you know, sourcing and finding material, you know, selling the extracts, dispensaries, you know, it was really just hard to do that while maintaining extraction process because, you know, finding and training skilled extractors and this technical job not only does it require on a manual system a high salaried, high technical skilled extractor in person, but then, you know, you're kind of tied to that trained person and become dependent on them and, you know, they're with all the new states opening up, new competition companies, or I found I was losing extractors to other companies, or they're starting their own business. So really being able to have automated equipment freed me up to be able to build my company and start finding sales, sourcing biomass, and um, really, you know, creating a team that I can run 24 seven, you know, seven days a week because you know this extractor is so easy that within 30 minutes of training we could have you know someone making live resin shatter uh you know sugar it's all recipe driven so with the io you know the ability to scale is really larger than any other system especially you know in the fact too that you know say i was an extractor that owned the company, but you know, a lot of times I see owners that are kind of now tied to their extractor because they're so reliant on that person. And now, you know, just like I was trapped to my machine, these, you know, people in the industry are, you know, somewhat trapped to the extractor. So just that freedom and ability, you know, has really enabled me to expand the team uh, to have a consistent process, a consistent product, you know, um, really following through on my toll processing contract and, uh, you know, expanding from there. Absolutely. So, you know, looking at um, kind of the breakdown of today's webinar, I mean, this is an opportunity to see, you know, visually bobsleds, um, you know, pretty much their whole facility here. And, you know, we're going to run to and show you guys fulfillment and oil storage, as well as finished product. You guys can see this is the lab facility. Um, and this is kind of the assembly line where we're preparing products basically to be shipped out to dispensaries. 
um, all over the state. Bobsled success story is, is uh, you know, is huge just in the amount of growth that they've been able to achieve over the last five years from 2017 to uh, to date, uh, 2021. And a lot of that is due to the production ability and the scalability of what the IO has allowed them to accomplish. So, you know, today's goal is to show you guys firsthand how that all kind of came about. So in a second here, we'll walk through kind of the unique install here at Bobsled and how we were able to um, fit, uh, essentially eventually fit two IO extractors in a nine by 10 C1D1 booth. It's a HAL uh, 85U uh, here being featured and uh, really just showcases the flexibility of, uh, you know, not only bobsled, but Luna Technologies on the inside side, um, on the install to be able to show you guys uh, what we can accomplish, um, you know, with our customers. And uh, from there, we'll go to, like I said, fulfillment and oil storage. Uh, we'll visit the uh, refrigerator. Uh, we'll take you guys into the mega freezers that store the fresh frozen. And then we'll walk through some post-processing, talk about terpenes, uh, assembly line here today, have a Q&A session at the end, and we'll end the webinar in a real-time live four of the run that we started uh, this webinar with. So I've posted links just for your information in the chat-in area, um, as well as social media, follow us on there. A recording will be made available for everyone here today for future reference as well. Um, so to kick things off, um, I'm going to jump over and talk a little bit about the install with Tyler. Then we'll bring you guys over to the fulfillment and oil storage area, uh, which is actually a uh, refrigerator. Uh, so, Tyler? Yeah. Well, Joe, if you uh, follow me, I'll show you. This, you might see that this is a little bit different way we've installed this Lunatech, where we've actually, for uh, to utilize the best space in this house, We've split it in half and put the system side by side. This is how smallest booth they make, the 85U. And we're able to process 400 pounds in a single day on one IO extractor. And by splitting it up in this design, our fourth Lunatech, which is on the way, is actually going to fit and sit in, on this side as well. So we're going to be able to have two Lunatechs and how smallest booth with 800 pounds a day processing capability and you know we do that by efficiency and this is the largest processing um that can be done based off of this footprint with this machine and it's all about you know minimizing those down times like you saw you know the one to two minutes of downtime in between runs so the pump just kicked off uh the process now has just started the soak process um but everything is you know temperature controlled maintained and uh you know really efficient and if you follow me we'll actually show you the chillers and uh the install in general so obviously we have the how we have the fire suppression system and then utility room where you can see our chiller set to negative 60 set to negative 70 and maintaining um the closer to the how these chillers can be the better because it's the least path you know when you're cooling it doesn't work you know the further away from the machine the more cooling you're gonna lose so if you follow back here you can actually see these lines are plumbed in through the wall and insulated. And then go on the other side of this wall is our how booth. Uh, this two inch PVC line you see here, these are water cooled chillers. So what this is running from our uh, water cooling tower, which I'll show you outside. Uh, these chillers normally, if you've been around them, they put off a massive amount of heat and we would require to have this room be air con conditioned because of the heat that the chillers put off. With these chillers and being water cooled, I mean, we could put them in a closet and they'd still run because they don't put off any heat. Here is our hot water. Um, this is what controls on the distillation pot and then 
for you to see here of a pump that's controlled by the computer, you know, when we need that heat to uh, recover our solvent as native. So fairly easy install. Um, our machine comes with all of the drawings. We work with, you know, your general contractor to set it up. Um, actually, let me take you out back here and we'll uh, see the water cooling tower. So if you see this, this is the water cooling tower, which is basically a swamp cooler. And this is just circulating um, the water. It's in a closed loop, and then this fan kicks on and will actually. And then the water cooled chillers are just much more efficient than air cooled chillers. Well, I could take you. If you see back here, this is how it's tied into the how. We got the four lines coming off the chiller and then they're hard to see, but you can see the hot water lines that are coming in off the hot water heater. And then these are ran in, these are pneumatically controlled. This is what controls all of the ball valves. So these get tied in through a manifold back where the chillers get in, but each one of these lines is controlled by our computer which manual or automatically opens and closes all of the ball knobs on the system. So that's how we're able to interact with the system and do run outside of the booth, all controlled from the computer. All right, awesome, Kyle, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna take you guys into the fulfillment and storage area. Uh, just a short clip. You guys can see the refrigerators to the mega freezers. Um, and uh, I'll pick that off right now. So right now we are in Bobsled's refrigerated fulfillment and oil storage facility. That allows them to keep all of this oil preserved and at a high quality, even in the hottest days of summer. But you can really see the Lunatex production. Um, you know, thousands upon thousands of grams of oil they have here, not only packaged, but ready to be packaged as well. If you follow me over here, you can see here's some of their tinctures and packaging they have going out. And then along this wall here, they have all of their oil stored in boxes ready for their salesmen and fulfillment team to get sent out and fulfill orders to dispensaries. And again, this is a refrigerated space, the entire space. And you have all different strains of all in 10 pack boxes. Over here, you can see some vape carts still ready to go into packaging. And then let me take you over this way. Now we're in a refrigerator now. This is the negative 20 walk-in freezer that they store all of the biomass in. So if you walk on through, this 3,000 square foot negative 20 walk-through freezer allows them to, after, you know, crop cover and harvest, to be able to maintain and store live resin, fresh frozen, so that they have consistent, high quality oil all year round. There's no drought going on over here. I'll explain this over here. You can see they have five pound pucks packed by strain. With the Lunatech, we have eliminated the need. There's no more packing or unpacking baskets. Um, we have these pucks that the extractor will just walk in here, grab a sock, drop four or five pound pucks into a sock for a 20 pound run, 
walk over to the machine, pull out the old sock, switch the new sock, close the lid and hit start. And your downtime is down to less than a minute in between runs. The runs that we don't have already packed up, this is how it comes from our farms that we work in. These are vacuum sealed uh, with a shop vac and each bag holds 50 pounds of fresh frozen. And again, we probably have two, maybe three weeks of runs already pre-packed, ready to go. All by strain, very easy. Now it's cold in here, Joe. Let's go hit the extractor booth. So yeah, as you guys saw, we're actually able to really, um, you know, on October, October, with that freezer space, we're able to, you know, freeze our entire year's worth of processing and hold frozen storage, fresh frozen, you know, that's one of the hardest things for growers is setting up those relationships and having the cold storage available has really enabled us to be able to freeze all of that so we have fresh frozen year round. Um, besides that, we'll go into this next video showing you uh, some of the oil and the after product. Yeah, and, uh, I'll load that video here in a couple seconds. I just want to mention on um, one of the features of the I.O. is uh, data logging and the ability to be able to, you know, show consistently um, and plan consistently for every run. Um, one of the things we hear, you know, often is, you know, that the I.O. is automated and kind of removes some of the artistry. And simply, I think it adds to the artistry. And the reason for that is, is not only can you get and run this machine manually, uh, you can also automate that process for consistency and follow-up. So um, I'm going to load this next video. This will kind of showcase a wide range of products. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the vacuum ovens and pulse processing as well as um, tokens with the cold trap. So here we go. Bob Sled Extracts has been kind enough to display this Dude, I'm sorry, I froze. oil. I... They predominantly run live resin biomass. You can see here the turp layer on top. Um, all of this is live resin ran through the Lunatech extractor, which does 20 pounds an hour of fresh frozen biomass and really it's the most high throughput machine on the market, which is how they're able to have so much beautiful oil on deck. You can see here we got our diamonds, which are really just the hottest product on the market right now. And you can really see the difference. Over here you have the diamonds and sauce that has yet to be separated. But if you look closely, you know, these are beautiful fauceted diamonds, which is really just THCA, you know, that 99.9% uh, THC. And this is done by crashing out the solution, the oil out of solution in a post process. Um, you're able to, with our machine, actually, ha it's recipe driven so that you can create diamonds, you can create batter, you can create shatter, all at the touch of a button with our, we're the only system on the market with the viscosity selector, which actually allows you to leave um, how much solvent is left in your product when you pour. And that is really crucial to this step of making diamonds and sauce. Because how you do it is you leave, you know, generally you want that one to one ratio of solvent to cannabinoids. And in all other systems, you got your extraction artist uh, 
looking in through a sight glass window, shaking it and trying to guess the viscosity so that he can hopefully get the consistency. In our system, we're able to choose the viscosity and get that one-to-one -one ratio every time. So you're pouring into your jar, you're pouring into your diamond miner, and you're having success and good separation, as you can see we have here. If you see and look over here, this is actually two versions of, you know, what's called HTE, which is also the top sauce or head sauce that has been poured off of the diamonds and has that THCA separated out. This is probably 40, 45% terpenes, around 40, 50% THC. And you can see the difference between the two we have here. One's a little cloudier it still has the THCA in it. So it's only had one pour off uh, and no secondary filtration. Uh, to get this clarity, we would pour this through a strainer, a stainless steel strainer, and collect all of that you know, secondary THC that's formed on the second process and filter it out to get this top sauce, which, you know, Companies use this, the flavor vape pens, they can flavor distill it with it. You can melt down the diamonds and have a liquid live resin diamond vape pen. I mean, really, this is the highest quality product in the industry right now. And the Lunatech has been built and engineered to produce this product at scale. Over here, I want to show you the difference. This is 100% cannabis-derived terpenes uh, that are cannabinoid THC-free. Uh, they're, yeah, 100% terpenes. This is strain-specific. we got northern rec terpenes here. And these were created in a cold trap. So the difference between the head sauce and these terpenes is the ovens are designed to keep, you know, as much of your terpenes in the oil as possible, but these are collected through that vacuum process. Now, if you have an oven system and you're not using a cold trap, I highly recommend it because all of this, if you've ever been in the lab around one of these ovens, when you flip it on, the whole room, you know, just fills with that dank, you know, cannabis flower aroma. And those are the terpenes just burning off into the atmosphere. With this system and this machine from Cascade, we're actually able to collect all of these terpenes, which are, you know, depending on, you know, bulk or how much you buy, we're from 20,000 a liter to 50,000 a liter if they're strain specific. You can see here in the oven what bobsled is doing. They're actually, you know, 100% of their oven is strain specific so that they can actually collect those strain specific terpenes. They're the only company I know that is producing this much oil with the, the ability to do that and have true live resin strain specific vape cards. Awesome. Uh, so from here, we're going to check in on where we're at. Uh, with our uh, real-time live resin run. Talk about a couple of the parameters that you know I spoke to a little bit earlier. Uh, we'll go through uh, some of the recipe parameters that ultimately give you your finished product. We'll go into a little bit more detail around the vacuum ovens uh, with regards to post-processing. So right now, I mean, the recipe parameters you're looking at is your soak duration, your drain pressure differential, your reactor covery uh, pressure, your solvent tank set temperatures, evaporative cooling, and I definitely want to feature the end run viscosity selector um, as well as your soak temperature. So I'm going to pass it over to Kyler here and I'll follow him around and uh, we'll give you guys uh, more of a rundown of the labs here at Bobsled Extracts. Just follow me. We'll check back in on the run. So right now, you can see we're in the drain process. And on the corner bottom of left here of the screen, you could actually see 
you know, the vacuum stage, the filling, the soaking. So it actually tells you what stage we're in. And you can see we're draining. Um, we have Joe brought up that set pressure differential. We actually are, you know, purposely maintaining, you know, this pressure differential. And, you know, you want a high pressure soak. And, uh, yeah. So it is V11 is the drain valve. It's currently draining from the material column. And to do that, it is pulling with the solvent pump and creating this continuous flow here that allows it to maintain the pressure while it's uh, pouring into a hot distillation pot that is passively recovering the solvent at the same time. So we have an active drain and a passive recovery. Um, this is the low level indicator right here. So this is saying that we have uh, solvent above the low level and this will actually kick off um, once there's no solvent left and then it will go into a timer which then finishes the drain and then just goes, kicks into the still and then recovers the reactor pressure so that it's safe to open. But while that's continuing, we'll talk a little bit more about the product we have in the ovens here. This particular strain is first class funk. Oh, and I wish you guys could smell it. I mean, it's just got a incredible funky nose to it. This is actually a local uh, genetics. It was compound genetics is the uh, producer of this strain. And it's just an awesome variety. You can see that turf layer on top. And then, you know, where it's dried out, the light crystal there. But this would be considered the sugar consistency. This consistency is nice because unlike diamonds and sauce that take a lot of extra time, you know, to create where you have that crash out happening, we're selling this product as fast as we can produce it. So, you know, this is really one of the easiest consistencies to package as far as gramming and, uh, you know, one of the most desired. It's still, when you have that sauce and sugar combined, you know, it's really the same as sauces and diamonds when you get it all back in. This is just before it was separated. Um, but, you know, if we didn't have this here, you know, you can load the, this oven with shatter. That would be poured on with to a parchment paper. And uh, the when we say the Lunatech is recipe driven and, you know, you can run shatter or live resin or sauce and diamonds, um, a key thing enabled to do that is the viscosity selector that Joe mentioned earlier. And that's what I want to highlight on right now. So the viscosity selector is what you how much solvent you choose to leave in your product when you pour it. And why that matters is, you know, for a product like shatter, you want to pour it out thick in like a, you know, a putty, you know, uh, ice, you know, soft serve type foam. And it just will spread out and muffin really easily on your parchment paper um, and less risk of nucleation or sugaring which happens like sugar i don't know if you've ever had shatter that uh you know part part of it sugars up you know that's one of the key things to make sh uh sugar is that nucleation so we actually to get this sugar consistency change it into the middle of our viscosity selector which is you know a five and it will actually leave enough solvent in to get the same sugar consistency every time. Now, if we wanted to crumble, we can, you know, move that down to two and it would be a much drier consistency and wouldn't have this wet turp layer on top. Um, and if we wanted sauce and diamonds, we would leave even more solvent in and then put it into, you know, a pressurized container and with heat and time, uh, you could actually get those diamonds that you saw earlier to crash out of formation and have that terpene selection. So that's all controlled automatically in our recipe by having that viscosity selector. And it's the only system I know of on the market that can, gives you that ability to consistently get those consistent end products every time. If you follow, you know, we'll just show you around. Like you saw the cold trap earlier. 
But if you see here, you know, we're gramming out product as it comes out. And uh, here we have, uh, this is uh, some cured resin that we're actually uh, decarboxylating and melting down so that it could go into a vape cartridge. But yeah, I mean, this is gramming. This is why we prefer the sugar consistency over shatter. It's just much easier to gram out um, than breaking up each individual shatter piece. Yeah, we'll give you a, yeah. Boom. There you go. Here's some of the finished product. Cool. Well. And then it gets boxed up, taped in a set box, ready to go into our fulfillment room, which you saw earlier. So that's kind of been the walkthrough. I think we're going to be ready to open it up to questions with Adam. All right. That was great. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. So we've got, no problem. We've got some great questions here. Um, so the first one, uh, Alan was wondering, have you noticed any differences in yield using pucks versus normal packing? No, uh, you know, we've actually been able to prove it and getting so on that packer, you could actually adjust it. And again, it's all about consistency. So we have the same pack every time, you know, it's really uh, for a long time, you know, when you're packing into these material columns, so, you know, you hear a lot of the different things. People are doing it differently or just pack as hard as you can pound it, you know, is generally what I've heard in the industry. But really being able to dial that into a pounds per square inch so you have the accurate, you know, same consistent pack every time. And we dialed that in on our packer. We recommend, you know, 110 PSI. And that packs it into, you know, a great compact puck that allows full penetration to happen. And again, it's the consistent every single time it's the same. So you could really actually look back and dial in those yields in a much, you know, better way than you could by hand packing and guessing, trying to get that consistent path. So um, got a question here from Quentin. He was wondering uh, if you knew what the actual material that our socks are made from. Uh, I, I will have to get back. We'll put that question up um, to answer. I do not know the exact material, but it's 25 micron uh, okay. filter bags. All right. And I believe it's a nylon monofilament. So um, just throw that out there, guys. Um, what gas blend, pure or pure propane or pure bro? Oh, man, I'm having trouble with that one. Pure propane or pure butane for a mixture of, of the two are you, do you recommend? Uh, I recommend a 70-30. Um, I used to run pure butane, and then I tried, you know, the Trimix. I tried pure propane. But I feel like that has uh, the 70 30 has been the solvent of choice for me. But a great feature, you know, on that IO is it actually uh, for that viscosity selector, since it uses, you know, complex algorithms based off of boiling points of the solvent and pressure and level and the uh, distillation column to figure that out it actually lets you dial in and choose what solvent, what ratio you're using so that you have that accurate recipes per what solvent you're using. So the IO is able to use any of the, you know, solvents or combinations of extremely well. 
and you can uh, dial in those recipes per what solvent you're using. So we have another question here. It's going back to the packer a little bit. Um, he said, it looks like most of the pucks are unground. Would you recommend grinding or chopping prior to packing or not? Yeah, if it's frozen, I do recommend that. Um, a lot of those pucks, you know, they do get broken up and then packed and, uh, you know, squished. But yeah, again, I'm a big fan of consistency. So if just as long as it's frozen, you don't want to like chop up, you know, dry material. You can l release chlorophyll that way. But if it's frozen before you do, it's 100% smashing it or grinding it or you know the future roller has a joint machine that actually works really well for breaking that up and you know all the same consistent size for rolling a joint but works well for extraction too great um do does luna offer a crc for the io luna does offer a crc for the io um but, you know, there's a lot of options out there and really all of the, you know, color remediation columns as you, just as long as you have a filter plate, a spool, the proper end caps, and it's in your drain line, you know, uh, pretty much all systems are able to uh, use one. So you can, if you have your own, you can implement it. But yes, we do offer a CRC package. Um, that you can use. We also are partnered up and distribute Media Bros, um, which we recommend for using those CRC applications, but you can use any of your own blends on it as well. Yep, and you can get in touch with your Lunatech salesman and he will get you hooked up. <laughs> yeah, and just on another note with CRC, how the IO you know, can really excel in that too is you know, that drain pressure differential, being able to you know select and push through that product you know on that active drain i know that's a lot of problems for a lot of systems out there is clogs and having to introduce nitrogen to push you know with the io that's unnecessary yeah i mean essentially it has inline de-waxing and the system is both active and passive recovery so uh, you know with the ability to be able to uh, have both processes be utilized, um, you know, in in conjunction with a CRC column that's been op optimized for the IO. Uh, we do recommend Media Bros uh, filter media, and uh, you know, ultimately, it's going to give you the best finished product based off of um, all these parameters and things that we've been able to test in R and D sessions and kind of move forward to uh, getting to a finished product with consistency for all of our customers. Um, I've got a question from Ian here, and he was just wondering for post processing for crystallization, what do you what equipment do you recommend? Well, yeah, a diamond miner is going to be, you know, an ASME vessel is obviously the preferred recommended. Do other people have success with jars? Yes, um, but recommended for you know safety reasons and purposes you want to use an asme diamond miner you know that cascade sells them uh, there there's really a lot of options available that uh, adam can put you in touch directly what to use yeah we uh we distribute those through lunatech uh, we are authorized distributor of cascade products so i could definitely get you hooked up on some of that information ian um, and then we have another question from Brian here. What screens are we using in the IO for filtration? Yeah, well, we have a uh, five micron centered disc and uh, as well as a um, 100 micron, micron uh, PTFB screened filter gasket with a backing plate. Okay. Uh, and then he also was wondering, how would you post process into carts for like a live resin cartridge? Yeah, so to get live resin cartridges from BHO, uh, you wanna obviously purge it completely. And if you can, 
pour the uh, crash do the crash out first, separate the terpenes and the diamonds. And then the best case is you put the diamonds in a pressurized vessel. Uh, you partially decarb them. That makes it, you know, that distillate consistency. And then you pour back the sauce back on and you have one of the highest quality possible vape cartridges on the market. But that's really the difference between distillate and BHO is the heat. Obviously distillate, you've already taken all the flavor and, you know, turned it into hot dog water and ruined it in my personal opinion. But, you know, the reason why it's the consistency works is because it's Delta nine to get all, whether it's live resin or, you know, cured resin, BHO cards are a thing. They are what's going to take over the predominant vape market because they have the best flavor. And, uh, you know, you can get BHO into that distillate consistency by heating it up, partially converting it to the Delta nine. And then it doesn't want it, it won't crash back out or get cloudy, you know, like if you put THCA in. So um, on that note, if you were to run a run and um, basically say that you were to do a shatter run on the IO, were, are you able to, um, to re-soak that shatter back into the solvent to then run it into another product if you decide after the fact that maybe it would have been better as a live resin or a sugar? Uh, you can. You couldn't change shatter into a live resin unless if it was fresh frozen per before that's live resin is a product that is only processed and done off of uh fresh frozen but yeah you can 100 percent redissolve that shatter and you could turn it into a sugar consistency you can make sauce and diamonds out of it you know depends the sauce really you know depends on the terpene content on how much sauce is yielded so you know you want to make sure if you are going after that saucy product that you start off with a terpene rich biomass. Okay. Um, and now Eric, he was wondering about with the biomass packer, can you run into issues with the pucks being packed so tightly that you may run into saturation issues, uh, maybe a channeling problem? Uh, how do you get around that with your pucks and the consistency of them? Uh, no, just because they're, you know, packed by the same pressure, you know, PSI every time uh, we don't turn it up high enough to pack into a uh, where it would get too tight. Okay. Uh, and a question that keeps uh, coming up is just if we're going to have these webinars available, um, they will be available on the lunatechequipment.com website on the webinars page. So if anyone has to jump out early, uh, just keep that in mind. You can always come back to our website and, and view any past webinars. Um, what temp were the hot plate stirrers um, that you had shown? What are you, um, what are you keeping them at, and how long do you decarb? So we actually don't decarb on the hot plates. We decarb in a pressurized vessel, but that is just uh, right before going into the cartridge filler, and we heat it up to about 160 degrees, uh, and then that gets it just into a nice consistency for it to be sped speedily, you know, loaded into a cartridge. Okay. And, and that kind of goes in with the next question, which you've already kind of touched on. But um, so Eric was wondering uh, if you could just touch again on why you decarb the sauce um, for the cartridges. If you, maybe you could go in a little bit more detail about the crystallization. Yeah. So THCA crystallizes, uh, which it can be a great thing if you want, you know, a sugar or crystallized product or, you know, diamonds. Uh, but it's not good for if you're going into a vape cartridge because you could actually have that crystallization happen in the vape cartridge, which would prevent, you know, you from being able to consume it all in the vape cartridge. So Delta 9 does not crystallize. So that is where heating up and doing a partial decarb on your THCA BHO, you're able to get it to not crystallize by turning it into Delta 9, which is the heat's required for that. So 
Delta 9 does not crystallize, which is why uh, this bullet stays in that, you know, consistency that's great for vape cartridges. But you can turn your BHO products into that distillate consistency with, you know, a natural cannabis derived flavor that, you know, is what people want to consume, uh, you know, just by heating that BHO up. Awesome. And uh, Garen, he, Garen just asked what we're using to pack the biomass pucks. Uh, Garen, I'm going to email you over a spec sheet for our Luna biomass packer. Um, and if you rewatch this webinar, then you'll kind of see uh, those in action a little bit. Um, but that's what we're using to puck these is the Luna Technologies biomass packer. Um, Alan is wondering what temperature do we set our water heaters at for the distillation column? Uh, 140 degrees. Um, that is just uh, pretty much what the top, that's how high the water heaters can go. You know, some could go to 150, but, you know, it's much cooler inside the distillation pot. It's set to 140, but inside when butane evaporates or propane evaporates, it it's actually cools down. So, you know, while the solvent is recovering, it's probably negative you know in a negative temperature inside the collection pot uh but the jacket is set at 140 and it automatically turns off after a run so it cools very quickly once it's off because of the cold solvent and inside okay but and i i had some follow-up questions on that is that 140 uh, celsius or fahrenheit fahrenheit um, what is the difference that you see between decarbing under pressure versus ambient or vacuum? Uh, the reason you do it under pressure is so that the terpenes don't boil off and escape. If you were to decarb under vacuum, you would be 100% vacuuming all of the terpenes off of your product, which is counterintuitive for vape cartridges. And Tyler, uh, let's check the run real quick and see where we're at with possibly doing a pour. And then we'll take a couple more questions. Yeah, we, we got time for a couple more questions. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, and if anyone wants to get uh, formal quotes for the equipment, then you can contact us at sales at lunatechequipment.com and uh, we can get you a formal quote. We just need to get a little bit of information from you. Um, so, and we're, we're getting a lot of uh, inquiries about the price. Um, all right. So, um, so you can see here that the uh, material column just finished. So it's actually now time to start and load the next run, which can be done even before the distillation is complete. So we're still in distillation mode, but the material column has actually been finished draining and it's been uh, recovered down to a negative pressure, which is now safe to open. So the run should be over in a couple minutes, but you can actually start and load your next run before this run is even completed. So virtually again, no downtime in between runs. So Kyler, uh, they're wondering what are the power requirements for the Luna IO? Yeah, uh, for the power requirements, I believe it's, about 160 amps, uh, three phase is needed for the IO. And a lot of that is, you know, the chillers make up the majority of that power draw. So okay. definitely need three phase and about 160 amps available. Okay. And then um, what do you weigh your pucks to when you pack your biomass pucks? Yeah, we do five pounds per puck and typically run four pucks in a sock, so 20 pounds per run. Okay, and just to touch on that, everybody, if you remember back to when we showed the freezer, the, the pucks, they're great for in process, but they're also great for just storage capacity as well. It makes it really easy uh, to store it and have an accurate understanding of how much inventory you have in stock. Um, can you pack the bio in a freezer? Yes, you can. You want a... Uh, air dryer on your pneumatic packer so that you don't have a buildup of moisture in the lines, but 100%. It's actually better to pack it in the freezer uh, just to maintain that quality of your biomass. 
works. Okay, and then how often do you swap out the desiccants in the in the molecular sieve? So on the IO, it actually has 24 hours of use. Um, it will actually, a message will pop up to switch out the molecular sieve cartridge. So it tells you every 24 hours of having solvent pass through it. Um, and that's based off of running fresh frozen products. So the most heavy, high moisture content product you could run. So if you run dry, you can extend that, but we recommend every, you know, 24 hours as it is. Yep. And, uh, and you're going to see the solvent tanks as well. So you're going to, the, the Luna IO HMI is going to let you know when you need to change the uh, desiccant and the mole sieve. And it's also going to let you know when you need to refill your solvent recovery tanks. Um, and then what equipment is needed for post-processing with a Luna? Uh, for post-processing, all you need is that vacuum oven to uh, purge your, uh, to, you know, that final purge of your product. So really the least amount of post-processing equipment is needed for BHO products because it already comes out, you know, in this machine fully de-waxed, uh, ready to go. And it's actually time for a pour. Are you guys ready to see? This is the for more of the first class funk. We have already been teared out on the Pyrex below. So we'll go. If you guys could see that color, it's coming out real nice. This is live resin. There's been no CRC uh, ran in this system with this product. You know, it just doesn't need it. And this was one run. Oh, just the smell is incredible. Might need another Pyrex. <laughs> we'll get it. <laughs> Let it settle. But yeah, normally, you know, processing fresh frozen can be a pain, but it's a very simple process with this equipment. And just, you know, seeing the jackets, they're right now, they're set at negative 80 degrees. Just, you know, perfect for running fresh frozen products. There we go. So yeah, and again, that's first class fun and no CRC. And that's a uh, thousand twenty-five grams that came out. Now, obviously, we're going to lose some of that in the solvent, but it was a very nice pour. Good yield and stuff. All right, yeah. And if you actually come here, we'll show you. So. Obviously, we had the check run was complete, but here's the distillation complete sign. So, it's so like continue processing to mix the next batch with the current batch and the distillation columns. Like so finished batch, to drain the distillation now. So, what we did is we finished the batch, so we drained it, and uh, yeah, we're ready to start another run. And it's simple as that. Back, back, back. You know, pretty much a run on the hour every hour. Uh, the only questions that we have is uh, what what is a average run 
yield is it basically is, is that an average run that you just poured no there? that was definitely a hard a, question. yeah that was a high yielding strain um i would say on fresh frozen it's between two to six percent is the range of yielding and uh that's a six percent yielder on that strain um but not all live resin is going to be that and because you have to think if you're not actually extracting less cannabinoids with live resin you're still getting 100 percent of the cannabinoids but with fresh frozen it's 80 percent water weight so if you do the math you're actually getting you know more out of your material running at fresh frozen than you would drying it out but you know five pounds wet would be one pound dry normally so you have to consider that when you're thinking about yields but you know two to six percent is fresh frozen and you know really six to thirty percent is dry but i'd say on average in oregon dry we're hitting around 14 15 percent on trim yeah it's, it's going to be a direct correlation to the quality of the input and that varies drastically depending on where you at or you're at in the u.s we tend to be a little bit spoiled here in oregon and uh, we get some of the best that the world has to produce, and we end up producing some of the best oil in the world because of it. Um, right. Uh, we are at time. We've got to let these folks go. Adam, I guess we got one more if you want to get it in real quick. Uh, so have you used forced air ovens for crystallization, Kyler? Uh, I have not used forced air ovens for crystallization, so I will have to look into that. All right. That was the last question. No. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks again, Tyler. We really appreciate Bob Sled uh, having us out and um, showing us their facility here today. Um, you know, we thank you all for joining us for Blow by Blow with Bob Sled. It's been a, pl a pleasure here to give you guys another look uh, under the hood. And obviously, we hope you found the information here uh, both informative and worthwhile. So uh, please stay tuned via email, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. We'll be announcing more webinars to come. The next one we're going to do is actually going to be all on post-processing and the recipe-driven uh, finishing products on the IO extractor. So I think this on the next one. So until next time, from all of us who want to technologies, Bob Sled Extracts, thank you for watching. We appreciate you. See you guys.